What's up, guys? It's Coach Croc coming back to you with another exciting, uh, uh, excuse me, another exciting edition of Meeting of the Minds. Today we have a very special guest, Davidson head baseball coach Rucker Taylor. Rucker, how you doing today, bud? I'm good, Chase. Thanks for having me. Excited, excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for the for your time and and, and the opportunity to speak. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to ask you, like, what got you into baseball? I know you're in a great situation. We'll get into that. We're going to talk a lot today about some cool stuff with mindset related, but uh, I always like to go with the first memory of baseball. What have you got? Man, first memory. Um, I don't remember this one, but I think baseball was in me at an early age. My, my, uh, my birthday's in June and I was talking with my parents a couple weeks ago on the birthday and, and mom and dad both said that first night I was, I was born, uh, dad and I watched the Cubs game together. And that was the, the national game of the week or whatever. So, you know, my, my, you know, first day being on this earth, I was watching a baseball game. So maybe, I don't know, that had something to do with it. But, um, you know, for me, I think my, my dad played junior college baseball. And so we were just kind of growing up as a father-son thing. And, nice. Uh, yeah, mom really enjoyed being around it with us. So dad coached me up until about maybe middle school. And he was always the assistant coach, the pitching coach. And he had a buddy that um, coached his son. And it was my best friend at the time. So we kind of just grew up playing baseball together. And, you know, really is more of a, a, a lifestyle than just a sport. You know, I mean that in the standpoint of, you know, if we had some free time, we'd go play in the backyard. Dad was a CPA and I have good memories of, of, you know, spring break for me at, you know, four, five, six. Mom was a school teacher, so she had, you know, she had that time off. And even though it was during tax season, Dad was really busy. We'd go up to the local the local youth park and we, we, Mom and I stopped by Dairy Queen on the way, you know, get a, a foot-long chili dog, get a blizzard, meet Dad, we'd eat lunch, and we'd go hang out at the park and, you know, hit, hit in the field, take ground balls, whatever it was. So, I think for me, those are some of the best memories and earliest memories. We won a a, uh, a little league, man, I guess it was district at that time. Maybe sub-district was the name of it. We won a sub-district over a big rival, uh, which was the first time in our little town of Gulf Shores, Alabama, that won one of those in, in a long time. And I uh, remember you know, being on the field, um, Kurt Fetters made a diving catch in right center. And that clinched it for us. And, you know, we all jumped around the field. And probably really one of my first memories, I couldn't tell you. I think I played shortstop in that game, but I couldn't tell you what I did. I couldn't tell you what the score was. But just remember Kurt made that diving catch and we were jumping around. And really just kind of celebration. And, uh, you know, the, the memories of that are probably the first thing that really jumped out at me. That's cool. And it's crazy how you can almost, you know, go back in time and relive that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Man, absolutely. And that, that's a, uh, a, lot, a lot of good memories of baseball. And, you know, probably as, as a lot of your guests have said, Heck, you know, just from experiences in sports, you you sometimes forget, you know, maybe that two one pitch. You, sh you should have thrown something different, but you you remember, man, those early morning workouts, which you maybe hate at the time, and you look back, you go, man, I'm, I'm 36 now. I wouldn't mind being around my college place for those those 5:30 workouts, um, just to have that camaraderie and and the, the team aspect of that and, and the friendships of it. Yes, sir. I mean, it, it carries with you a long time. And 36 years old. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's. Uh, and you put numbers up on the board, unfortunately. And D one baseball coach. I mean, this is this is pretty cool. How do you, how do you get there that fast? Uh man, I don't know. It's uh, fortunate been around a lot of good people. Uh, I think I got some good advice at times, not to necessarily look for that next job, but just do the best you can where you're at. And right. I think I've been really, really fortunate to be around some good people. Um, you know, mentioned to you earlier before we got going here. You know, uh, Cliff Godwin, you had on earlier. He was a coach of mine at Vanderbilt, and you know, probably my experience at Vanderbilt has a lot to do with, with where I'm at now. From the, you know, Coach Corbin was the head coach at that time, but Eric Backage is now at Michigan. Derek Johnson was the pitching coach, who's now uh, major league pitching coach with the Reds. Cliff was the ops guy in 2015. Um, a guy named Mike Kalitri, who's in the Phillies organization now. Uh, Mike Holder, who's at North Georgia, and then Blake Allen, who's the head coach at DePaul. So I was around a lot of really good people. Um, a lot of my buddies are, are now both at the college and professional level. We were texting some guys last night, you know, good luck to the pro guys. And uh, a teammate of mine is the first base coach for the Giants. Uh, this is kind of his major league debut last night after playing for a couple of years. He was the, like the pitch runner on Derek Jeter's last uh, – Antoine Richardson is the name. He was the pinch runner on Derek Jeter's last hit in Yankee Stadium. He scored from second. It was a one-out backside line drive. And Antoine could fly. I like, Antoine, I texted him, what – you get that good of a read off that because it's a line drive and first base and laid out. And if that guy catches it, it's double play, extra innings. And he's like, no, man, I just took off doing that score. <laughs> uh, but just, you know, just, just like I said earlier, it's kind of a, it's kind of a lifestyle and just the friends you make in the friendships, you know, in the game, you certainly pull from your bodies that are, you know, outside of the game too, but certainly guys are inside of it. And I've uh, just been very fortunate to get here. But I started at, 
uh, Sanford University was, was a really a graduate assistant there, which is a position that kind of doesn't exist anymore. My high school head coach, Tony David, was the recruiting coordinator there. Uh, you know, drove two hours down the road from Nashville to Birmingham and, and worked for Casey Don and learned a ton from him. And then Tony and Mick Philbine was a pitching coach and just really good people. You know, I learned a lot about myself being alone for the first time. Um, you know, I was a volunteer for six years, so it was, you know, it, it was rough right, at times. I think it made me a much more appreciative of that first paid job here at Davidson. Uh, being around Coach Cook is an excellent, excellent human being and uh, taught me a lot about, you know, the, the academic environment here at Davidson, taught me a lot about, you know, managing people, uh, being a quality person for the, the guys you're coaching. And we had an opportunity after our, our 2017 season, um, we had, went to the Super Regional there and had a lot of success. And the school was, they had a little bit more funding coming in from some different sources. And after the 2018 season, Coach Cook moved into an associate athletic director role, which he's really excited about. And he's our oversight right now. We have a great relationship and it worked out where I was able to stay here and, you know, take on that, that new task as head coach. So I've been very fortunate to, to be around good people, uh, both other coaches and really good, good students too, you know, student athletes at, at Sanford and here at Davidson. Certainly it's been a, been a blessing for me. Absolutely. Davidson Quality University. We'll get into that in a second. Um, that old saying, you know, you're kind of the sum of the five people you're, you're around. It sounds like you've been around some really good people and, and yeah. high quality individuals that you kept, uh, you know, alluding to. I mean, you're fortunate because you've been with those guys, you've learned from them, and, and you've taken a little bit from probably each and every one of them, right? Absolutely. And I think that the order, especially the college coaches, the head college coaches I was around, the order of Coach Corbin to Coach Dunn, to Coach Coco was a great order for me, me specifically at those points in my life. It taught me a lot about myself. Again, I think in a really good order, I was very fortunate in. And, you know, looking back, I'm not sure I could draw it up any better. So right. I think you're right. You know, you're, you kind of gravitate to make people are like-minded. At the same time, you got to be able to push yourself outside your comfort zone a little bit. I think that's something that Coach Corbin certainly did for our, our class. You know, my freshman year was his first year. And it, it, there's, there's a lot of guys from that first team that, that were not around in year two. And, and right. as we look back and talk about it, there, there's been some cool stories written about it. The Athletic did a, a very nice piece and, and, and that interviewed some of us. And, you know, we're very fortunate to be around great coaches at that time, but also a lot of us as individuals that, that stuck it out. Uh, we're, we're really close as a result of it. So, yeah, it, I agree 100 percent. I'm fortunate. Uh, the people I've been around have been good people. And right. whether it's the – I haven't made some other opportunities along my coaching path to make, you know, five or six thousand more dollars here, maybe go work at a, a perceived better program at times. The people I really trusted, their advice really helped me look at it and make my own decision. And I think a couple of decisions that I listened maybe to, you know, the outside world, you know, maybe social media is a little bit bigger at that point. Yeah, I might have taken a job that put me not in the situation I wanted to be in. So I'm very fortunate to have had good counsel in addition just to be around good people right right and i think about some of the times i've had to make tough decisions that I, you need that counsel you need somebody that you respect yeah. to, to help you make the right decision or at least give you some advice for you to make the decision and then go with it um yeah. davidson 13 and 3 at the time of the the covid pandemic um i know you guys were geared up you were excited tell, tell me a little bit about first of all tell me a little bit about the program and then tell me about this year how how uh how bad was it when when covid hit yeah, so it's a, this will be my, gosh, I was here six years as assistant. This is my second year as head coach. We're going into year nine. I think since my second year, we've uh, kind of been on an upward swing. Uh, I think that was the last time we'd had a, a losing record. My fresh, uh, first year, uh, we set the school record for wins, I guess, in 2017. Went to a uh, super regional for the first time in school history. And actually, our first regional in school history. Uh, so, you know, kind of uh, killed two birds with one stone, both regional and super regional. Uh, this year's 13 and three start was our best start in school history. And, you know, we, we were young this year and, and not necessarily young, just from, from being freshmen, sophomores, some guys that were you know, maybe sophomores and juniors that hadn't played a ton as far as everyday guys, we were really young on the mound. We lost three weekend starters, one still in pro ball, one's in med school, um, one's in law school. So, you know, there's that kind of beauty of days. I mean, you're, you're going to get some guys that, that play pro ball. We want guys that want to play pro ball. You've also got guys that are, um, you know, doing some pretty cool things out, outside right. of football as well. Uh, so, you know, we thought we'd be young in the mound. We had three sophomores that, that um, two guys really took jumps this year. Our closer as a freshman it was excellent. He stepped in that Friday night role. And we pitched at a really high level. Um, Parker Bangs is our pitching coach, played at South Carolina. was there in 2010 when they won uh, the first of two back-to-back. -back, and he's done an excellent job with the guys. And 
had four or five freshmen that came in and, and really stepped in some big roles out of the bullpen or midweek. And uh, we played a little bit better defense this year than we have traditionally. And uh, normally we've got to be able to drive the ball in the gaps and sometimes over the fence. We did that at a pretty high, high raise well at points this year. So it was, it was a fun year in that, you know, we got done with the fall and, and, and generally at the fall as a coach, you have a, a, a decent idea of what you're looking at as far as your team. And we kind of looked at each other in the office here, man, I don't, we could be pretty good. We could be really good. I don't think we'll be bad, but we could be really average. And, you know, I think we start off that track where we're going to be maybe, you know, take above average to pretty good. And there's definitely some excitement uh, building into it. But, you know, like everybody else in the world, uh, um, early mid-March happened and, and things have been a little bit different since then. Yeah, so so it did happen. And, and how did you break it to your guys? Were you, were you with them? Did you have to Zoom them? What, how did they get? Yeah, so it was uh, – Weird deal, and not to go blow by blow with it. We played Tuesday night down the Charlotte, the Triple Park, the Charlotte Knights. We get one home game down there a year, and nice. a quick plug for them. It is they take care of us like we're a big league team. That's a beautiful facility, uh, wow. man. It, it is pregame, postgame spread for us. Uh, each everybody's locker has their name tag in it. Nice. Like Davidson, you know, Rucker Taylor three, whatever it may be, and I do the same thing for the visiting team. And we we're supposed to play Duke down there two years ago. Got rained out. Um, played them again this year. Coach Paul really want to play down there at the ACC tournament, being um, being in Charlotte this year, planned to be at least. So we had a, a great game. We actually won on a, a one out um, walk off two run homer and off their you know, all American closer, and um, that was a probably the best game we played all year collectively. You know, one through nine innings. Part of you wishes you, you knew that was going to be the last game to maybe favor it a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, in the sport of baseball, you know, we played really well. We we're going to enjoy that. And Wednesday is back to practice. So for us, we had a normal practice Wednesday. We actually inter-squatted. Uh, Thursday rolled around. And at that point, you could kind of tell nationally things were, were churning. Um, and without too much detail, we were we had a 4.30 practice schedule. Right around 4, maybe even 4.20-ish, I think the NCAA announced that the spring, you know, the College World Series was canceled. So we actually in the room I'm in right now, our, our lounge, we met, we met at 4.30, you know, basically told the guys, hey, for us, we've got one more non-conference weekend. Our administration has decided that we're not going to play that, um, but we are going to play our, our conference weekend next weekend. Um, if you guys want to practice today, I'd love to practice. If you guys won't want to, I'm good with that. So the guys say, no, we absolutely want to practice. We want to be here. Right. We'll get some level of normalcy. In, in the back of my mind, I kind of felt like this was going to be a, a weird 24, 48 hours. So actually, as they went out to stretch, I stepped back and, and kind of little league style called the local. Um, there's a great pizza place right now. I called them and said, "Hey, can I get, can I get 20 <laughs> pizzas delivered?" Um, and it worked out that my my mom and dad were up here visiting for for a few weeks, and they uh, dad ran and got the and true little league style. Dad ran and got the pizzas and brought them back. So we got we got done about an hour and a half of practice, and guys were walking off the field. And I don't have my phone with me during practice, but Coach Munger. Um, you know, pulls out. He goes, "Hey, you need to see this." And, and you know, it's on Twitter where um, the Atlantic Ten had canceled all spring sports. So we had probably five or six guys there in the locker room. I was right on first base. So, hey, guys, come back for a minute. And um, don't remember what I said. No, it was emotional. No, it was was tough. We were basically gathered on first base, and um, you know, some guys, as you would expect, got pretty emotional. I think that's something as a you know, as a college coach, you you want to see emotion from your guys. You want to see that they felt there's an investment there. And, and certainly saw that. So I think we, we sat around uh, for a couple of hours just, you know, literally eating pizza on the field like it was, a, you know, a summer um, Little League game. And, you know, some guys were crying. There's a lot of hugging. And, you know, at that point it really wasn't, hey, guys, I, I, this is the next step. It's let me regather. Uh, we talked again the next day as a group. And, and then really I think starting that Friday afternoon, you know, guys kind of broke up. So it's almost like, you know, the traditional end of the season where you don't play whatever tournament you're in, you get back, you have that team meeting, and it's just gone. And I think that's the the tough part about college baseball is, you know, generally you're playing once school's out and you get back to campus and those guys are gone. And, you know, that iteration of that team, you know, that group might come back for an alumni deal, but it's, that's tough when you don't get that same right. feeling with that group again. And that was just maybe that on, on steroids in, in this situation, plus the, the uncertainty. And I think as coaches, we try to prepare our guys, we try to help them as much as we can. And, yeah, they really want a playbook for this one. So it was right. just trying to be as honest. We kept hey, don't know what's going on. We'll give you the information we have. And I think they handled it really well. Uh, it is a mature group. And I think they responded about as well as you can expect in those next couple of days. And I think for the most part, guys are handling it pretty well. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Coach Pollard and I talked about it. It's baseball, it makes you like callous. It makes you hard. You know, you, you're used to failure, and something like this getting you know getting everything taken away from you is is it's just shocking. But the only thing is, everybody in the country had to deal with it. Um, so you said you didn't have a playbook. And you had to create one on the fly. Obviously, how did you stay in contact with your with your guys? Did you did you keep doing mental exercises or anything that you did to keep them together over the the I guess cancellation? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the biggest thing, and, and I think this is a, a great a great trend you're seeing in college athletics, and I think high school too, is I, I think coaches are more you know it's not one size fit all. And for us, what that looked like was basically us as coaches reaching out to guys individually, especially that first week or so. Uh, we have a, a freshman us from Hawaii. His mother oh, wow. was comfortable with him jumping on a plane, so he actually went and stayed in, in Eastern North Carolina for a couple of weeks uh, with some guys in his grade before he headed back. And now he's up in Wisconsin playing summer ball. So for us, it was really one first of all, make sure they're they're safe. They had somewhere to go. Um, there's a couple of guys that were possibly going to stay at my house for a little bit till things calm down. Uh, figure out where they're going to store their stuff. I mean, college did a great job. Some of those just basic day-to-day -day things um, to, to help them out. You know, from there, once they got situated, talk to some of the older guys, hey, you know, where are we at as a group? What do we need right now? Uh, I think some guys really wanted to get back connected as, as a group. Um, some guys just need to be by themselves and process a little bit. So for us, we, we kind of went back to about a once-a-week team get-together. And sometimes it's just simple as just getting together, talking for 30 minutes. As we got a little bit deeper into it, we went to a little bit more baseball or just general person specific. Right. Sports, be it other baseball programs, and certainly some, some programs on our campus where a month into this, they were, you know, our guys were doing, you know, Zooms every day for class. Mm -hmm. We're finishing out that semester. I think listening to some other sports, there's some programs that maybe were Zooming every day. And by man, the end of, of March, they were just out. So, you know, how are your guys doing? They're still locked in. I go, yeah. We're, we really looked forward to it in our house. Like, well, you know, we didn't do it every single day, you know, March through the beginning of April. So for us, it was getting them some level of safety in general human being, hey, are, are your needs met there? And then we move a little bit more to the, okay, let's talk maybe some baseball. Let's talk big picture and get a little bit of comfort back there. And, and fortunately, for, we probably have about two thirds of our guys are playing summer ball right now. So I think that's an excellent get back in the routine. Most guys have access to some kind of workout facility. So really for those, those guys were trying to provide the, the right weight room material, the right, hey, let's work on this from the baseball side and just make sure they're okay as human beings first. Absolutely. And what's that old saying, you know, they don't know how much you care until they, well, how's it go? I, I'm, I'm going to blow it here. Uh, uh, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, showing that compassion side, sharing those tears, um, you can take yourself back to, you know, little league, they're going to be able to take their self back to, to that day where you told them, you know, the season was over with Yeah, uh, that emotion is going to be tied to them forever. And, you know, I know you, you felt build them back up and, and I know they're chomping at the bit. I mean, are they excited to get back on the field for, with, for you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. I think it's, it's getting back here, seeing each other. It's getting that back in that routine. Mm. I, I'm just really, really glad that those guys have the ability to play this summer so they're, they're getting the reps in and they're not just you know at mom and dad's place you know for six eight months in a row and that, that's a lot you know if you if you um you know if you have the ability to play baseball the ability to get in the weight room i just think there's some some mental positives that come for that for those guys and okay. yeah, there's definitely a little more pep in their voice when you talk to them you know when they're asking you a mechanical question as opposed to you know, hey, what's going on right now? Because that, that, that what's going on right now question, I, I don't have that answer. That mechanical question, I may or may not, but I can probably figure it out, uh, that what's going on right now, I, I don't have that one. So, yeah, I think our college, like most people in the fall, there, there's going to be some changes. I think our guys are aware of that. That's probably our, our biggest, or my biggest concern right now is how do we best prepare them for the fall as people, as students, but also how do we organize things on the baseball side you know, so they're getting better, our team's getting better, we're also keeping everybody safe. And that, that's something that you know, there's a lot of conversation about, there's a lot of thought about. And as you mentioned that playbook earlier, you know, that playbook about how to tell the guys the season or that, that one doesn't exist. I've yet to find that one for the, the, the fall of, hey, you know, we've got these restrictions going on, this is what you do. And, and a lot of that's you know, talking to people smarter than I am, which is easy to find people like that, and, and just taking ideas and, and trying to, to, to piece everything together. Right, right. 
I'm, I'm terrified being a high school coach. You know, I hadn't been able to do anything at all with my kids. I have had a couple meetings like zoom and, and Google meet, but yeah, high school athletes aren't college athletes. They're, they're not going to be self-motivated for the most part. I mean, there's going to be some, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm worried about what it's going to hold when we get back. Uh, yeah. How are they, they going to be mentally? How are they going to be physically? I mean, are they going to be out of shape or, or are they going to have done something to really prevail themselves? And, and that's my, my hope. Uh, is it that did is, is that they did all yeah. right so talking about mindset then let's get into the to the nuts and bolts um does davidson do anything to help coach mindset or do you guys have a sports psychologist come in to work with your team directly so we have probably in the last year year and a half spent a lot more focus on it and a lot more attention to it and i look back you know especially as an assistant i say you know guys you just gotta be tougher you know you gotta right. be tough. you gotta compete well, you know, the reality is, 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 you know, those things can be developed. And I, I think I incorrectly, and maybe from my background as a player, hey, just do this, do this, and just be tough. Well, what does that look like? So we started, I guess, two falls ago, and it actually took this from, from some level from, from Vanderbilt, from some level from, from Cliff at ECU, where we would start having, you know, in the fall weekly, we just call them team talks, kind of a knockoff of TED Talks. And, you know, the, the very first one was, you know, what is success? And, you know, how do we define it? Not what does the world say is success, but what do we define it as for us individually, us as a program? That actually bled into a couple of conversations. Uh, from there, we talk about some other things like consistency, accountability, confidence. And once the coaches led the first five or six, we actually turned over the players. There was a wide variety of things that, that came up. And, and maybe the most unique one, we had a, a two older guys that led a, a green dot safety training, which is basically bystander training. And when they asked me, can we do it? I was like, you know why you know, it's, it's about being a good person it's about being a good teammate it's about taking care of each other it's about doing the right thing so you didn't come out through that one's like wow like that's actually a really good idea so for us it came not just hey let's be a better baseball player let's try to mold that person the best we can right. um within this year a little bit more specifically um we had a a alum named andy bass who's now a pirates middle skills coach and incredibly intelligent guy he was drafted out of Davidson in 2011. Um, you know, his story and his version of it, so I'm repeating it, he basically threw 15 straight balls uh, in rookie ball. And as the pitching coach walked out and he handed the ball, he basically knew that his, his career was probably limited at that point. Uh, got released after the season, got picked up by a different organization, uh, kind of the same issue. So for him, he wanted to figure out why. Why am I having these issues? So he went to, to graduate school. In psychology, you end up picking up a, a motor skills learning um, inclination as well. So he's now not only mental skills, but also motor skills. Wow. We've had, I guess, maybe four team conversations with him. He's worked with a lot of our guys individually as well this summer. It's been great for us to as coaches because we've got access to him. We've asked not just the mental side, but also the motor skills side. Just a really, really intelligent guy. So I think that's, that's probably been the biggest thing we've done collectively. And a lot of it, too, is just trying to get inside the, the guys' heads and trying to send them specific information. We had, we had one older guy that was really struggling with finding a routine this summer. And, you know, you, you know Cliff Godwin mentioned you know, his guys do their daily routine each night. For us with this guy, it's just him and I talking, hey, here's – you know, Alex is his name. He's like, Alex, I'm, I'm going through the same thing. First time in my life, I haven't known exactly what I'm doing each day. I struggled with this for a couple of weeks. Here's what's been working for me. You know, why don't you try this and run over it? So we talked about, about a week later – Coach, you know, that th this is working for me. Uh, similar guy, I think we're going through the same thing. We talked about that. Coach, this isn't working. So for us, it's been find out what, what's the next step, what's the best thing for that guy. So I think it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. You know, it's those individuals. Our guys are so smart. And I think just, you know, just young adults in general today they have access to so much information. It's not necessarily saying, hey, go look on the Internet, go look on Twitter. But it's trying to find, okay, what works best for you and why? We had a Zoom today with a former player. Um, graduated from here, I guess, 2017, had the opportunity to go to med school, ended up being an undrafted free agent, a couple years pro ball, and instead of going to, to farm school, she was in med school, he's now um, a development coach with the Dodgers, and probably the most competitive guy I've ever been around, bar none. And what he talked about was, you know, each year is maybe something, but for me, I knew it worked for me, because I, I was told, spiels, he got to do this, he got to do that. He goes, well, for me, if a guy got a hit off me in the first inning, I don't care if the rest of the lineup got a hit off of me. That guy, the next time he came up, was not going to get the hit. He really struggled giving up runs the first inning his junior. So he said, senior year, every outing in the fall, 
I'm not giving up a run the first inning, period. Now, I might give up five in the second, and I can live with that for today. But for me, that first inning, I'm absolutely positively not giving up that run. So for him, he's even switching stuff you know, within his career, getting to pro ball. He said, you know, I, I, I'm top out at 89, 90 at best. He goes, my first rookie ball game, or short season, I guess, he goes, the first guy out is 95, 97. He goes, I'm kind of sitting around going, huh, you know, this this isn't good. He goes, you know, I'm – I'm kind of making jokes to my teammates about myself. Oh, I'm, I'm going to touch 85 today, maybe. He goes, all, he goes, all that was was a safety mechanism. He goes, once I flipped the switch and realized, hey, I'm just because every single one of these guys, I'm going to be the best guy on the, on the field for those innings I'm out there. You know, that's what worked for him in pro ball. So in a long answer to your question, um, you know, we may be as in-depth. Sometimes we don't have a necessary – we don't use maybe a Brian Kane or some external uh, resources like that. But it's something we've talked collectively about. It's really something I think by us talking about it, we're seeing a lot more guys that are being comfortable expressing what's going on with them. And that's been a really cool thing, I think, to see the growth from maybe 10, 15 years ago when I was playing in college. I mean, if you had some, something going on up here, you didn't talk about it. You know, maybe your best friend. Um, oh, Chuck, but, Chuck Knobloch, right? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How about that? Um, um, I'd love to have his career. I'd love to have those issues on that stage. I'm sure he oh, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, just, just the, I think the amount of guys that there's a limiting factor up here, I think that that's absolutely a real thing. And I was listening to a podcast the other day and Alan Conkle was a, a coach on South Florida. He said, you know, that the, the best steroid you can give your guys is confidence. Ooh, and I really right. never expressed that way. It was like, well, that, that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good way of talking about. So for us, it's trying to build up that individual. And I think if that happens, if that guy's confident in the classroom around campus, there's going to be some carryover on the field. And I think whether sport you're talking about, you want confident individuals and just in life as well. Right. And I, and I believe I've mentioned this with a lot of coaches. Um, I, I didn't think mental toughness could be taught. I thought you just had it or you didn't have it. And I was wrong because I've seen people develop over the years. I'm like, wow, that kid went from that to that grown man right there. How did that happen? And it happened in front of my eyes. Um, so, yes, it can be taught and there's things you can do. Um, I want to go back to success. You, you said that was one of the first things you talked about. Yeah. What, was the, what was the best uh, description or, or definition of success your guys gave you? Hmm, good question. I think the the consensus that we kind of came to say, we're, we're going to hang our head on, on this a little bit, is we're going to do everything within our power in that moment to do what we think is right. And if we're doing that, and again, you hear a lot about process, 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 you know, numbers don't matter at the end of the day. And again, to some level, there's some truth to that. You know, to some level, you want to have a great process. But for us, it was, are we doing the right thing in the moment? And I think if you can do that consistently, I think you will see success. Again, that probably gets back to the whole idea of process. You know, Nick Saban's famous for process, process, process. Now, he's got really, really good players. Right. I give a job. Uh, so that makes me those wins and losses a little bit easier. Uh, but I think for us, it was it was rewarding those those minor successes. And doesn't always mean okay. So we we had a, a walk off win against Duke on a you know top ten team in the country, a great moment. You know the guy that hit that was a senior uh, that had really struggled on, on off speed pitches down, and that was something we hammered on him um, the last year. Or so so he hits a you know, it, was, it was a hanging slider, it wasn't necessarily down, but still an off speed pitch in, in a neutral count. And, you know, he runs that ball out. Um, the guy that was two batters forward and that got on base, this is someone we hammer. And whether you say it's physical toughness, mental toughness, I'm not smart enough to know. But we had a, a right-handed hitter that, that you know, he rolled on a back-up right-on-right slider. You know, it, was, it, was, it was shoulder area. It wasn't a, a cookie at the waist. You know, so maybe that guy's not at the right mindset. He does that. Also, he doesn't get on base. Right. You know, so it's a different game. Um, you know, so for us, it, it's, it's rewarding those little things daily. I think that's the, the good and bad thing about baseball is it can be so monotonous right. that, you know, okay, well, we got a game today, got to get ready for practice tomorrow, game tomorrow, game practice tomorrow. But it's trying to stay in that moment and reward those little things. And I think Cliff mentioned, you know, you try to reward those little daily victories. Well, you know, sometimes you see you know, these, these people are successful at the end of the day, or in very few cases, they just show up on that grand stage. It's minor wins, minor wins. There's going to be setbacks. There's no doubt. And that's maybe the toughest thing, I think, for, for the athletes in baseball our age. I'm sure you see this with, with your athletes. It's you know, there's going to be failure. 
every single athlete or single person is going to fail. I think in today's you know technological age, we see so much so so much success on TV, so much success on Instagram. You know, everybody's on these great vacations during quarantine, and, and I'm, I'm excited. You know, to hear his teeter right now. <laughs> um, you know, so it's kind of it's kind of kind of educating. You know, what is what is reality? You know, what can what can you do each day? You know, what can you do for yourself? And, and if doing X doesn't make you happy, and but doing Y does, but nobody else is doing Y, but it's still good for you. Let's go with why. There's nothing wrong with that. It's kind of developing that confidence to do. We've got a guy that's having a great summer, and he's actually talking to my, my dad about this. And you know, he's like, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm just – I'm really relaxed because it's summer while I can try some new things. So for me, I go, man, I've got to make sure that guy, when he comes back in the fall, he's got that same level of freedom. And I've got to figure out how to get him to that point, which, which how he does it is going to be completely different than that guy's locker on that side of the locker room. So it's a uh, – I, really I really wish I'd taken psychology – <laughs> grad student and undergrad student because there's so much of that right now and I, mean, I think going in a long answer to your question to what is success it's you know it, it's when having those daily those daily small wins it's being in the moment it's being your best in that moment and that's not good enough okay we'll, we'll regroup we'll recover and we'll, we'll go at it the next day the next year wherever it may be but i think that's a it's a really good question i think a lot of different programs maybe only look at it as okay i've got to graduate these guys i've got to get this team gpa We've got to win X number of games. Um, so I, th I think it's really how do you value it internally and what does your program look at it as, as a group perspective? Yeah, Dr. Rob Gilbert, I don't know if you ever heard of him. We, we share success hotline. Um, we ask our athletes to do that daily, make that call. And he talks about how winners lose more than losers lose. And, and mm -hmm. you know, because winners are going to keep battling and keep going after it and, and keep doing the little things to eventually become a winner. Yeah. And to me, that that is a process. And, and, you know, it, it can be trained like we talked about earlier. And I love that. Um, how about visualization, meditation, deep breathing? You guys focus any on, on that yeah. aspect? Yeah. So that, that's where Andy was great. And I, you know, I'm going to jump back to that, that last question. I sure. realized that, you know, you know, winners lose more. You know, that was something that in 2019 we really emphasized a lot in our practice. Our training sessions was, you know, we're going to try to challenge these guys more. You've heard a lot about this in the coaching coaching arena in recent years, you know, hey, these guys have to be able, it can't just be, you know, for, for, for baseball, you know, underhand front toss, sit the ball to you. Know, we want the challenge, we want these guys to be, be in, in failure. I think I made a mistake in 19 in that we have guys fail, but we, we really help them, hey, how do we recover from it? What do we learn from it? I'm just saying, okay, we're really smart. They're going to know how to figure it out. Well, sometimes maybe that's when you do have to encourage, hey, let, let, maybe try this tomorrow. Okay, maybe try this the next day. So I think this past year in 20, we tried to create even more failure. We also talked about, okay, how do we respond? How do we bounce back from it? So uh, I, th I think that was a, a really big growth for us this year. And I think a valuable, valuable life thing hopefully those guys take away. Uh, but, but jumping to your question to, with, with meditation and visualization. So for me personally, um, and many, many years ago, a guy named Dick Mills had this, this pitching philosophy uh, some of the pitcher at Arizona State was a first rounder there, and he was huge on the mental side. So for me, never heard about it. First time I ever tried visualizing anything mentally was, you know, he said, "Hey, put yourself in the stadium you're gonna be pitching at the next day. You know, you you, you arrive, you do everything. So basically, you go through that whole pregame. You get on the mound, you go through the lineup, and everything's just positive. And I did it, man. The next day, I went out and pitched the best game of my life. So you know, whether <laughs> you're sold right was, away. Yeah, I'm like, oh wow, this is good. So, you know, so that, that's my personal experience with this. I started, I did it some in college, um, was a below average at best player at Vandy. Uh, probably my best year, though, I spent that Christmas break doing a lot of visualizing and me having success. And for me, I, I did see some carryover. Uh, we've got some guys here at Davidson that have tried it. We had some guys at Sanford once there that tried it. Zero success, hated it, no thanks. I just want to crank the volume off. Right. Song, that, that's, that's my process. That's fine. We talked with, with Andy Bass a lot this summer about guys finding their own individual thing. And he's a huge believer in breathing uh, and, and mindfulness. So we did some very brief demonstrations with our guys this summer. I think some guys have used that in summer ball and found some success. A lot of our hitters, uh, I think I've heard some guys talk about with you, a lot of our hitters do use the mental reset of looking at the, the foul pole. Um, okay. Very, very popular. I think Evan Longoria made the first guys I heard talk about that. On the professional level, but a lot of our guys do do that. We encourage all of our guys to have their own process. Uh, we talk about we probably talked more in the fall about it than we do in the spring, which which maybe 
I might need to reverse that a little bit to make sure we're doing the right thing in, in the screen. But something we want them to have the ability to articulate themselves and to know why they're doing it. Yeah, you know, sometimes yeah, coach, I look at the I look at the the scoreboard. Okay, well, why? Well, you know, I heard you guys say we should have something. Well, <laughs> you know, okay. Um, yeah, I think you know, bangs with the pitchers. I think those guys certainly had the freedom to, to do their things. Um, we had some guys that come in and they are on the days they're starting, they're sitting right here on one of these couches and they're talking to everybody. They don't care what's on TV. They don't care what music they're listening to. They're just hanging out. I mean, there's not a set meal. There's not a set pregame food. They're just going. We've got other guys that are, and they've got the noise cancelers on, and it's the same playlist. They're stretching at the same time. They're doing the exact same routine. And that's what they do. So I think for us, Again, yeah, not being smart on what is the exact best thing for everybody. We've got to get them the freedom to experiment with it. We've got to get them the ability to try out and also have the ability to come talk to us, hey, this is working, this isn't working. You know, what suggestions do you have? I think this time with, with quarantine has allowed us to, to have more team conversations, which seems kind of silly now that, you know, we're not in the same room, we're on the same stream maybe. <laughs> I think right. guys have had the ability to maybe connect with some guys that go through the same things. That's something we're absolutely going to do more this fall is have more group conversations around topics like this. Hey, what's working for you and why? Um, I listened to a podcast the other day and they're talking about pro ball. Some of the best two, I think it was Monty Lee was talking about pro ball, some of the best two strike conversations they've had were just the hitters getting around, you know, 14, 15 guys. Hey, what do you do with two strikes and why? And talking through those. I think that for us, it's that communication, it's that dialogue, and letting guys ask questions. I think what's been great in the last couple of years, you see guys are not afraid to ask, you know, the, the, the dumb question. They're not afraid to ask it, and they're not afraid to, to look maybe silly. Hey, I, I should know this by going, so why is this what it is? And I think that's been great to see that growth, that comfort level kind of really blossoming guys to, to, to be open like that. That's cool. And that's good. I mean, you know, most of the coaches we talk to are, are the same way that every player needs something different. So you can't tailor just one system. You have to give them a lot, a lot of the tools and exactly. it's up to them. And, and, and that's our saying mindset makes the difference. Would you agree with that? Does mindset make a difference? Yeah. And I think whether you're talking, you're talking baseball, you're talking life. I mean, it, it's, uh, I'm uh, Christian, Christian myself has read something in daily devotion the other day and, you know, just of it was, is, you know, you can have this happen or this happen. How you view yourself, how you view the world is going to determine how you react. So if I'm going to do this, I'm owed this, I'm owed this, I should have this, we should have that. And this happens, you get punched. All of a sudden, you that woe is me. So right. the toughness that we talk about all the time, but if I've got the perspective of, man, I got punched, but you know what? You know, I've still got two arms and two legs. I've still got a mind that functions. I still got, you know, a family, a wife, a house, like I'm in a pretty good spot. You know, I, I'm pretty blessed in, in, in the grand scheme of things. Whereas you may that person that, that gets that and they're, oh man, why well, I should have this, I should have that by now. And it's just how you respond to it. I think there's a bazillion phrases and analogies that relate to it. But for me, man, my, if you think about successful people and, and we even use the, the world's journey, you know, term of success, they're probably very many successful people that get by with a woe is me attitude, with a I deserve this. Um, a lot of those people, they go out and they take it, or they work for it, they work for it, they work for it, they work for it, and all of a sudden they're overnight successes, right? You know, what's that old analogy of, you know, that overnight success where there's about 10 or 15 years building up to that. All right. Of a sudden, you know, you're a star, right? Um, you know, Kurt, Kurt Warner's an overnight success, you know, the old quarterback. That guy was stocking groceries a year earlier. All of a sudden, he's, you know, he's on the Super Bowl and, and, get into a lot of cool things. So I think for me, you, you pull for people that you can see that, that gradual there's, there's investment and you, you pull for those people. And it's nothing to take away from the, you know, the, 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 the elite athletes. And there's certainly some guys that can roll in college baseball, maybe not be a great teammate, maybe not be uh, um, the best worker. They're just so dang talented. It doesn't matter. And in pro ball, there, there's, you know, there's outliers like that. But man, you look at, you talk to, to really smart baseball people. What's the difference between uh uh, an everyday major league guy and that triple A kind of four A guy and, and more than that, those guys are gonna tell you it's right here. You know, can that guy handle that over four on a Thursday or does it bleed into Friday and all of a sudden it's an over eight? You know, and if it is over eight, okay, big deal. You know, that's part of it. I'm gonna get mine, I'm gonna get mine tomorrow. That's because you know, a lot of our successful guys at the college level, it's not always the prettiest swing, it's not always the best athlete, and especially with our younger guys that come in and contribute early, that's you know, what what they have right here. And some of that's they're, they're blessed to have great upbringings. 
uh, you know, the whole nature versus nurture thing, you certainly can get into that. Those, those younger guys that play early that I've seen in college, it's not always the best athlete. There's got to be some physical strength there for sure. But for me, it's those guys that are, that are rock solid up there and, and they bring positive out in their teammates. You know, those are guys you want to be around. So it's you know, a long answer to your question. I think mindset, whether it's baseball, life, I can't think of many things that that mindset's not incredibly important and a huge piece of what you are, I think. Yeah, Ed Davison, and, and, and this is going to kind of, we're going to play devil's advocate here. Yeah. Your kids are so smart. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're not going to process this stuff right. It's like, well, no, that can't be right. This is not logical. You know, I can't do that and help you. Do you ever deal with that? Yeah, and I think in a good way. And yeah. I think the the beauty of, of a Davidson, a Vanderbilt, a, a Sanford, some of the places I've been, the, the, the students, the athletes, they're so smart. As a coach, you've got to be prepared. Yeah. If I show up for a practice, and I'd love to tell you, every single practice has been perfectly executed and scripted. And you know, we had a Zoom this morning. I sent out the Zoom a week and a half ago. I sent out a Zoom reminder last night. Well, being, you know, I just I, I didn't send the actual Zoom link. So it rolls around. I sent it to the coaches. I sent it to the players. So it's like 9.50 a.m. I'm like, where are these guys? I started getting texts from our leadership council. Like, hey, coach, like, can you resend it? So I'm you know, mind going, oh, 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 wow. Like, I got all this stuff planned out. And I botched it. So that's pretty easy when they know, hey, you know, coach, coach messed that one up. Um, I, I, I took the full blank for that one as I should have. And then you own it. I mean, that, you just, yeah. that's how you teach yeah. them. Hey, I own it. I sucked. I didn't put my, I didn't put the link in there. I yeah. can't believe it. I was so busy, you know, make sure we're prepared for it. Right. I, I skipped basic stuff. stuff I was too prepared. prepared for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think within that, you know, they know, you know, if we're not, you know, if, if coaches, we're having a disagreement, which we'll certainly like you know, behind closed doors, you know, I don't have yes guys in our staff. We've got guys that have their own opinions now publicly, you know, in front of the guys, you know, we're certainly unified from here. That's incredibly important in, in an organization. But I don't want them to say, yes, yeah, so let's do it as you think so. But if they're not sure, I want them asking why. Why are we doing this? Because the players are asked, why are we doing this? You know, they're, they're smart. Um, they've got access to a lot of different information. They've done it differently in the past. So for me, being around these educated people, we've got to have a plan for what we're doing. Um, doesn't mean it's always going to be executed properly. Doesn't mean it's always the best thing. And we get a lot of feedback from our guys. You know, we, we want especially some of the older guys we trust and they've been around a little bit. Hey, what do you think about this? Or even as a younger guy, hey, you ever done anything like this? No, sir. What'd you think? Uh, I hated it. Okay, well, why? It's just really tough. Okay, well, do you think it accomplishes what we're trying to do? Yeah, I think so. It's just really tough. All right, well, in that case, hey, we're going to do that again. <laughs> it's just that guy. We're going to make that guy get better at it. Sometimes with some older guys, we're trying stuff new. And, you know, Johnny, what'd you think? Ah, you know, I, it was different. I liked it because of that. But for me, it really made me do, you know, it made me, made me maybe do that instead of that. Well, man, we don't, we don't need to do that with that guy. And there's zero issue. So we, we want those guys taking ownership of their careers and their development and doing it in the right way. So, so to answer your question, it makes us be, I think, incredibly prepared as coaches. I think, and I've done some reading on this during, during this quarantine time and talking with some other coaches I've been at places, you know, the, the guys, the athletes we're getting, they are, there's so much pressure on them to be successful. Most of them have done incredibly well academically. They're you know, graduating, if, if not the very top, towards the highest in the class. In most cases, they're great athletes. So they've always been succeed, 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 and generally coming from good places with good loving support. But there's pressure to be the best. And all of a sudden, you get to college, there's a lot of other people academically that are just as, 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 as intelligent as you are. There's athletes, excuse me, the same old athletes you are. And all of a sudden, you've got to recalibrate to, okay, well, I might not be the best at something right now. Can I handle that? Okay, or, or mom and dad still gonna be proud of me? Um, are my friends still gonna look at me as this great athlete? But I'm not the best athlete. So I think that's something, especially in this academic environment, that I've seen more and more in the last couple of years. Is guys that are, man, they're really talented. They really care. They really work. You just might not always, even though you do those things, you might not be the best at what you do. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you're still trying to make those improvements. So I think that's for me. Probably the biggest thing in the last two years I've, I've really become more aware of is these guys have a lot of pressures on them, internal and external. They might do some really great things, but they're still really struggling right now. You know, how do we continue to build that confidence You know, if they're not playing every day, if they're coming out of the bullpen throwing one inning a week, where a year and a half ago you know, they were the all-star, you know, they were the hotshot recruit. Um, it, it's a, definitely a battle in that. There's no question about it. 
typically being the smartest kid and the best kid on their team. I mean, then they're coming in and they're just, you know, a, a contributor. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. They're going to develop. There's nothing wrong with that. And that doesn't take any way, any way from, you know, somebody's got a, a lesser ACT score, SAT score, and, you know, they're working just as hard. You know, it's, it's can you maximize what you do? I think we talked about guys a lot, you know, there's a lot of advantages to being at Davidson. You're putting yourself in a great situation with the academic reputation here, the type of learning type environment you're going to be in. But even that doesn't guarantee you anything once you leave here other than that piece of paper, you know, it says you've done something really cool and you've been alive experiences that maybe other people don't get. You still got to go out and earn it and make that degree be, be more valuable because you went here, not less valuable because you haven't. I think that's a, that's a whole other conversation for down the road. But uh, there's just a, there's a lot of pressure on these guys. I think the, the, the COVID um, virus this, this summer and spring has certainly put some different challenges on them. And the NCAA sent out something, I guess, last week or this week, and they did surveys of athletes and you know, the number of athletes in different sports that experienced mill stress during this time. I mean, the, the numbers are just – um, they're, they're high and they broke it down in a lot more different classifications. And I think collectively as a college, and I think probably as athletics across the, the country, I think coaches should be more aware of that as we should be. And we've got to make sure these, these students are in the right place mentally, you know, not just physically, not just helping us win games. Yeah. These kids have, have suffered something that, you know, we're, we're suffering with them, you know, just a different way having to see them go through it and then having to see them what they're going to do with it when they come back. I mean, if if we come back, there's still so much uncertainty, yeah. and that and that just that's what nobody likes because they can't have an answer, and everybody wants that instant gratification, and we yeah. can't. We got to be patient right here. We're guys testing our patience right now. Yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff, though. So so we'll kind of end with this. I know your time's valuable. Um, the magic question we always like to ask is, what percent? If you put a number on it, what percent would you say uh, the mental part played in the game of baseball? Man, I, I think. I don't know if saying a hundred's too high, but for me, if you, if you talk, if you're going out and maybe playing in a wiffle ball in the backyard, you know that that's a much different version of baseball. If you're talking about whether it's a it's a high school guy, you know, playing 25, 30 games during that season, he rolls into a summer ball season, playing 30, 40 there. You're looking at college, you're playing 60 plus in the spring. I think we start stacking those days on top of each other. That's when that, that middle level for me just ratchets to the highest possible degree. Um, I, I think the vast majority of college athletes in any sport, I think particularly baseball, this is a huge, huge piece of the puzzle. Can you handle success? Because you know, all of a sudden, man, you're a freshman, you're going, hey, I'm the starting shortstop, I'm hitting three hole, I come out, I'm hitting, you know, hitting 350 the first weekend, and man, the, the girl I really like in my English class, is, you know, she's smiling at me a little bit different now, and People are congratulating me on Twitter and this and that. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, that, that same guy, you take, you go, you go face a tough weekend and you're hitting about 20, you know, can you respond from that? Yeah, I think that's the, the challenge. And the, the guys that are really good at this level and the higher levels, you know, there's day in and day out. They're sticking to what their plan is, what their process is. And they're not on that roller coaster. And that, that's an easy, much easier thing to say than do. So for me, Man, I even look at you know, do we have a good practice today? And if not, I generally take that's that's my fault because I, I, I didn't set up the right environment. But more often than not, I can tell you know when they're in the, in the lounge or in the locker room where are they at right now. There's been days where I've had X, Y, and Z in mind it's been posted on the board, and you just kind of get a feel from talking to a couple guys maybe pre-practice, and man, they they can't handle this much right now. We're going to back off. We're going to do something more fun. Uh, right. There's been plenty of times we finished practice and we've either gone lighter or heavier than planned. And I'll call our strength coach and, hey, man, we, we, we had this plan, we did this, and maybe back off over. Hey, they, they were great with this. Let's maybe something to reward them up there. So I think it's, it's trying to have the pulse of your team as much as you can. And so much for that of me is not just, okay, well, okay, my body doesn't feel great. Well, I think you had some guys on there talk about David Goggins with his book. Well, what does he say? You're, your, your, your mind takes you to about 40% mm-hmm. or your, your body almost about 40% of what you can actually do. Your, your mind says, okay, you're done. No, you got, you got, you got way more you can push through. For us, is okay, can we push them, not to the point of getting them hurt, but can we push them to the point of progress? I think maybe, you know, the rowdy is now, you know, I think people are more aware of what's going on. You've got to be maybe a little more careful of how you do that. Mm-hmm. 20, 30 years ago, hey, come on, do this, do that, you know, yelling, screaming. Now you've got to have different, different, you know, as you said, tools in that toolbox as coaches, too, of how do we push those buttons 
sometimes you got to push them. Sometimes you got to pull them. Sometimes you got to put your arm around them. You know, how do we get those guys to go somewhere different? I think mm-hmm. that's the cool part of being a coach. As you said, can you teach mental toughness? Yes, absolutely. You see that guy that went from here to here by the time he leaves your, your, your presence, your program is how do you get those guys to those next steps? And that's a, for me, that's a, it's a never ending process. I think for me, when I first got a coach, I love the X's and O's of it. The more I do it, it's more, especially setting that head coach's role, it's okay, how do you get this team mindset where you need to be? Okay, well, if this guy and this guy are down in that corner, okay, are they affecting anybody else? They know we're good. They are, okay, how do we get these guys back where they need to be with the group? And I mean, that, that's a never ending battle. Actually, sure. it's, it's a fun thing, it's a challenge. You know, it's, you know, sometimes I miss the days of being a, a volunteer. I was doing lessons, you know, four lessons a day, four hours a day after practice. You're putting a ball in the teeth of little Johnny. You're trying to get him to, you know, hit a backspin line drive. Uh, I think some of this stuff is, is, is more challenging in different ways, but it, it's, it's a lot of fun as well. So, yeah, oh, yeah. And much more more gratifying. And, and you know, you just get, you yeah. get more out of it. And, and, and what I'm hearing from you is it's about the people. It always goes, comes back to that. It's all about the people. If you know your people, how to treat people how to communicate effectively. And, and to me, that's a mindset. I mean, you, you have yeah. to be a people person to be a coach and a, an effective leader. And I can tell just by hearing you talk, uh, you're on some special things in your coaching career. I feel like you're going to be around for a while. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm special communication there. That's, that, that's something that I don't always enunciate the best. And that's how I'm working on it. So that's part of the view of getting to do these things this time is I'm trying to, to you know, how are these great communicators? How do, how do they effectively communicate? I mean, some, I don't, I don't have Twitter. I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, Instagram, but you know, we're trying to be more, you know, over the phone with guys. We're trying to put information in front of them. So they, if they truly have those eight attention, eight second attention spans, which some people say they do, they see it, boom, 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 and it's gone. So it's just, it's a never ending process, man, but it's fun for me. I, I like reading, I like learning and uh, trying to help it use that to help these guys. So I guess I'll, I'll ask the uh, overtime extra in a question here. Yeah. If you, if you had the one tool in the toolbox that you need to be a mentally tough, mentally sharp baseball player, what would it be? Confidence. And that, that, that's why that's just my boom reaction. I, uh, I think I'll give you a different one, but no, I like that. It's that's confidence. great. It's confidence. Right. I love that. We, we have a, we have a series on confidence. We have a series on uh, aggressiveness, present moment. We, we mentioned that a little bit today. Uh, it's huge to be in, in the present moment because if you're thinking about the past and the present's going to yeah. kick you right in the face. But um, especially in baseball, I mean, it's one of those things. Man. Yeah. Let's talk about it for hours, really. <laughs> you mentioned being in the moment. That, that's something is, hey, you, know, you, saw, saw, you saw some kids back there, man, as you get older, you know, you got your husband, your father, you, know, you got this bunch, this way, this bunch, that way. And, and sometimes it's, it, it's, you know, hard as a coach to be in that moment at practice. I love being at practice. I think I, I'm probably better at that than a lot of things. Right. You got, you know, family member sick or you've got, you know, a kid that's sick. All of a sudden, man, you know, you, you look at where am I? Like, I didn't need to be here. And, and much less with, with our athletes where you know, maybe they had a, a bad biology test. Maybe the girlfriend's mad at them. Maybe mom or dad's sick. Maybe there's somebody in the stands heckling them. And all of a sudden they, they're over for three and they've got to go get in the box facing, a, you know, a plus arm. I and mean, that, that's not always easy to be in that moment. So I'm with you. I mean, all those things are great. And um, being in the moment, just enjoying the moment, too. You know, I think that's something that we get to overlook. It's, uh, you know, enjoy where you're at. And there's nothing wrong with that. you got to have fun. It, it, and ultimately, it's just a game, right? <laughs> it is. It is. And it, the game teaches you a lot. And the game shows you a lot. You know, I think at our level, I think, you know, we're not – we're not on, on ESPN last night, you know, from a, a national auction. Winning and losing really, really matters there. It matters here. It's also, you know, what, what are we doing to develop these guys? And to me, that's that's the, the challenging piece. It's a rewarding piece. That's why I really love the, the college level that I'm at. Good job. Um, well, Coach, I really appreciate your time. If there's anything that we can do with you at, for you at Winning Mindset or Baseball Mindset set in uh, particular, Please let me know. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the Wildcats on the field next year. Yeah, absolutely, man. I hope we're out there. <laughs> we're all out there. I hope, I hope there's Friday night football in high school. I, I love college football. I love high school football. And, and I, hope, I hope we're all out there playing. be great for the kids and, and the fans and the community. So I'm, I'm pulling for that and, and, and everyone to be out there back home as soon as we can. Absolutely. Well, Coach, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll see you real soon.